Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Fernandez, and I am a failure at Kickstarter. <laughs> Welcome to Talking the Tightrope. Uh, tonight, my guest, the man covering his face up right now, feeling ashamed for me, is Mr. Mark Gardner out of Austin, Texas. Hey, how's everybody doing? It's not shame for you, James. It's just I, I feel your pain. I feel your pain with that. Oh, uh, yeah, I definitely know I'm not. I definitely know I am not alone uh, in that particular experience. Uh, mine is just a fresh wound. Um, at the end of the day, we uh, got about 8% of the $25,000 we were looking for. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing is that I learned a lot about the crowdfunding process and, more importantly, what it's going to take to break through all the noise, all, you know, the sort of cacophony. Um, to try to get people to pay attention and to see whether they can do it. So for right now, the project will go on the shelf, and I'm actually going to write um, the equivalent of the political speech for when you lose a campaign. It wasn't a concession. I let myself go all the way down to zero on the clock, uh, and I was soundly defeated. But I'm going to let you know about what I've learned, uh, how the experience was, and uh, where we're going to go forward with apotheosis. So, back with us and our guest, Mr. Mark Gardner out of Austin, Texas. He is a web series creator. Uh, his first foray into web TV was Sell the Series, an award-winning series. And he is now the sort of emperor of the vlogpire. Uh, I just invented that word. It may not have been a word before, but I have made it now. No, I've heard emperor before. Emperor is a word. Emperor is a word. Vlogpire is a new word. I know. I was playing with you, sir. Okay. I see, I see what you did there. I see, see what, what I did there. I'm not a funny guy, but I try. Uh, I'm not a funny guy either. Just ask my friends. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the emperor of the vlog pyre known as Weird Girls, which actually is also uh, an upcoming web series um, that Mr. Mark Gardner has been working on. So thank you so much for coming out with me tonight, Mr. Gardner, and having a conversation. Oh, sure. It's always fun. We talk a lot. I like talking. It's a fun thing. No, talking is a very fun thing. It's yes. it's a lot better than street fighting, and it hurts just a little bit less. A little bit. A little bit less. So, so let's uh, let's start at the beginning with you, because I, I'm interested, I, I'm really interested in getting into the background for you, because um, like me, I'm out of southeast Michigan. I'm like an hour away from Detroit, uh, and I'm trying to build something here that, um, you know, an, an entertainment kind of entity that can sustain itself without having to just migrate to LA. It's not about like ignoring or being too cool for Los Angeles, whatever, but it's just trying to create viable entertainment entities outside of the traditional hubs. And you come to us from Austin, Texas, um, where you created Cell, the series, uh, where you're working on Weird Girls with both um, your, your group of vloggers and as well as trying to build the series itself. But how did we get to web television? Because you came through radio, correct? Oh man, I came through a very circuitous route, but my my. Route, Take us through the route. Take us through the route then. Way back in the day, because I'm getting old now. Way back in the day, no, I I actually did a lot of stuff in student radio back at the University of Texas in undergrad. I was student radio. I did broadcasting. I was I was the voice of women's volleyball at the University of Texas. Welcome everybody to the University of Texas Gregory Gymnasium for tonight's match between the University of Texas Longhorns and the Michigan Wolverines. Did that stuff all day. Loved yes. it, actually. I, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, Did you have any Don Cherry sweet sport coats? No, no, no. I didn't. Oh, bummer. Sorry. Being on radio, I just showed up in polos, you know? It's just like, eh, jeans and a shirt. I'm on the radio. I got a face for radio. Who cares yeah, thanks a lot, radio. Thanks for ruining everything. <laughs> um. So that was kind of my background, um, but I was always dabbling in other things. I kind of took a foray out of that for a while, and I eventually got sucked back in to what I was doing before, where I was writing um, screenplays. I ended up writing a screenplay, was working with a uh, small production company here in town on a uh, series. Uh, it was a we had the pilot written, we had the entire first season mapped out, we were ready to start pitching it to all the producers and everything, and then our main producer backed out and we had to scrap the project and everything. But that was right around the time that Felicia was starting the Guild. And I started watching the Guild and thinking to myself, there's something here. There, there's, a, there's a thing. This, this can be a thing. 
So I tried to get my uh, co-writers at the time to join me, and they, they weren't that interested. So I went off and I kind of did my own thing, and I started writing my first project um, that was Cell. And I wrote it, I worked through it, um, I got some other jobs because I had left what I was doing before, and I was doing some other jobs and just trying to work screenplays on the time. But I completely developed that out, and I took it to a local screenwriters group, and we finished doing the read-through, and they said, hey, this is kind of good. You should make it. So I did. And the rest is history. I, I never directed anything before, but I studied up like a madman. I watched a ton. I got, an, I got a sense of what I wanted my aesthetic to be. I watched how people directed things, mostly on television, uh, a little bit on film, but kind of got that and basically taught myself how to be a director and went from there. Um, emptied out my bank account and made sell. And now I'm here. A few years later, I'm still still plugging away at this thing. And let's just be glad that you're not broadcasting from like a cardboard box in an alley after that. <laughs> that last couple sentences, jeez. No kidding. Yes, I, that 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 kind of hurt. But you know what? I I really looked at it as an investment. Um, it really was kind of an investment in what I want to do and where I want to be. Um, as a creator and as somebody in the really in the world, if they may sound spiritual for a moment, sure. Um, you know, I want to be a creator. I want to achieve these certain things. I want to do these things. So, without taking a risk and without putting myself out there, the chances of that happening are pretty much zero. If you want to achieve anything significant in your life, you're going to have to risk at some point. You're going to have to put yourself out there. So I did. I still am. I'm still out there. I'm like in the middle of the street hoping somebody doesn't hit me with a car. I'm like, hey guys. <laughs> yeah. the, do not do not hit the tall man in the red and white t-shirt, please. I'd appreciate that. You can give him some money to help him out, but just don't hit him with your car. That's not cool. That would be the money part would be great. The car part, not quite as fun. No, not as fun, yeah. Lit litigation and body cast are just not as sweet as sitcoms tell us. No, it's really not. So you you came to sell um, and you got some awards for that, correct? Yeah, it was actually uh, I was really really happy with how sell turned out. We we got some early support from a company called Coldcast, who is no longer around. Coldcast yeah. is a older company, which is very sad. Um, but when sell came out, years. I couldn't put sell on YouTube because it was too long. There was restrictions on how long episodes could be. For those young whippersnappers watching right now, you used to not be able to put videos up over there that were more than just like three to five minutes long. You couldn't do it. Um, if you had something that was ten minutes long, you, you'd not go on YouTube. Sorry. So Coldcast saw some of my early work, liked it, decided to take it on, and they were great. They, they promoted things. We got million views, million plus views on the thing over on Coldcast. Uh, it was great. And for a drama with episodes that are 15, 20 minutes long from four years ago, I'm really happy with the fact that we got a million views on the deal. The crappy part now is that when you look at YouTube and you look at it, you're like, well, we only got a couple hundred views. Like, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, the illusion of lacking metrics, yes. Yeah, so I'm like, you know, guys, really, people did watch this at one point. Yeah, dang, nabbit. Do you have, like, do you still have the um, metrics from Coldcast that you can use as well, or is it just no. like... It's, no, on a black box. Those are those are gone. No, oh, what a bummer. Yeah, I mean it's it's all right. It it is what it is. Um, anybody that really wants to see this show, and we still have people that discover the show now. Every once in a while, I get a message or an email or something, somebody saying, "Oh my God, I just saw Cell. What is this? Where did this show? What? Why? So it's still out there. You can find it, and people are still finding it. It's just it doesn't have that initial when we launched it. We had that huge spike of things going on, which is sad. That makes me sad. Yeah, the, the the moment yeah, momentum begets momentum and so losing losing that momentum can definitely I know where I can be a killer, I can see that. Yeah. Um so from from Cell, um cuz with the series Weird Girls coming up, which is quite a contrast from Cell's sort of theme and emotional vibe. How did we get from Cell the web series into Weird Girls? Um, but before you started doing the blogging or anything, what was it that made you think, oh, okay, well, I did a um, you know, 15, 20-minute drama. I know, let's do a coming-of-age comedy for young women. 
Um, it's kind of, the, there's a few angles that I really took to get here. And actually, why don't we just start on just the scripted, because that's it all started around the scripted thing. Um, it actually started, I was at a Korean restaurant. <laughs> Korean restaurant, going to a UT volleyball game. Um, we were meeting some friends of ours and their families. They were all going to the game, and they had some daughters who were around 12 at the time, I think, something around 12, maybe 13. Anyway, um, and this was right in the middle of the release of Cell. So we were still working on getting Cell out and about to everybody. Um, we were sitting at this Korean restaurant. There were about like 20 of us, I think. I don't know. There were a lot of people there. Anyways, however we ended up sitting up, somehow I ended up sitting next to the kids' table. And about halfway through the dinner, I started realizing that I was more interested in what the kids were talking about than what the adults were talking about. I was kind of like leaning to the side, like paying attention here, but just cracking up inside at these people beside me. So when I left and we were going to the store, I, I told my wife about it, and I told her, you know, I was like, you know, these, these kids are hysterical. Oh, they were great. Oh, my God, this was great. And the more I started talking about it and I started thinking about it, slowly but surely it turned into this idea of where there needs to be a Goonies with girls. And that's what Weird Girls turned into being. And I decided right then that that's something I was going to start and work on. And the more I worked on it, the more I fell in love with the characters, the more I fell in love with the world, the more I fell in love with the potential of this to actually be something. And that's pretty much uh, whenever I had some free time, I would write some scripts. I actually sent uh, an early draft of the pilot to an IWT writers group in L.A. I dialed in via Skype. And yeah, I was actually part of one of those. Yeah, it was when they were still doing the long-distance ones. I was there yes. for that. Yeah, so it was, it was very cool. We had great feedback on it. Uh, I got some good, some good words about it, and some thoughts about different ways we could go, things that worked, things that didn't work. Went back, revised it. I did a full table read of the entire season, and everybody that was there was just loving it. So at that point, I was like, yeah, this is something I love. People are digging it. It's something that I need to make happen. Um, and then things have spiraled from there, and I have philosophies of why I'm doing certain things, why I'm not doing it, why have I not shot it yet? Why have I not shot this yet? I could have, but why have I not? And there's reasons why all this stuff is going on that really get into the philosophy of what I'm trying to create. So Now, have you been able to shoot, like, any test footage or anything? Um, have you been able to put, like, a cast together at this point? What what kind of groundwork do you have set up, at least, if, uh, if any? So last year, I was able to scrape together some hormone money again. Dang it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's our favorite thing. Look at our faces. Jeez. Look how much we love money. It's the best. Anyway. Damn. Um, I got some of my money, and I did shoot a spec pilot. Um, we got some cast together. We got a location, got a great crew out, and we shot on a weekend. It was tumultuous. We had to change our shoot day at the last minute because we lost location, which means we lost three of our cast, so I had to recast. So we only had about two hours of rehearsal total before we went in the next day and started shooting this spec pilot. But do have the spec pilot. I have a lot of fun with it. Um, considering it's something that I slapped together, I look at it as more of a proof of concept that I can show people and say, this is how the writing's going to work. This is how it's going to look. This is what we're trying to accomplish. And I think it does that well. So I'm using it for pitches, and we'll see. We'll see. Now what I'm curious about is... Um, you know, you created Cell back in 08, 07, 08 is right around there? Mm, more like 09. 09, okay. So you created Cell in 09, and now we're here, and you're trying to sort of develop the base uh, of weird, the narrative side, the scripted side of Weird Girls. So from your experience, how has, I mean, in just those five years, the idea of, of television on the web has mutated and evolved so rapidly. Like, just insane. No one saw... I mean, at the very top of the scale, no one saw Netflix giving Kevin Spacey $100 million for two seasons of a political drama. Nobody saw that coming. Um, and even at the time, Kevin Spacey readily said, 
all the networks said no, and no one wanted to touch this, and uh, Netflix took a shot. So that's the top of the scale, but even doing you know independent and original series uh, at, at this level, on the YouTube level, uh, we went from The Guild, we went into There Will Be Blood, we've gone, and Lonely Girl 15 was towards the beginning. Um, personally, I am a fan, I am a acolyte of Homestar Runner. Um, I worship to a tasteful shrine of Homsar. Uh, whenever I get a chance, I wear a bowler hat and do non sequiturs. But just it's exploded and it's changed. And we go to Lizzie Bennett and we go to now Emma Approved and Pemberley Digital and New Peter and Wendy, uh, Rocket Jump, the rise of, of Freddie Wong and Brendan Lotch and the evolution in the Rocket Jump. So from your perch, your perspective, how has it changed for you from Cell Two weird girls. What have you seen? What have you experienced? You know, what's great? What's not working out for you? Oh, man. That's such a huge question. Oh, I, I bring the heavy, sir. I bring the heavy. Well, I will tell you how great you are later. I bring the heavy now. <laughs> what What is it meant for me? Well, let's... Wow. Um, a couple of things, first of all, is I think, kind of like you said, nobody... Really, this has really blown up in the past year. If we really look at it, the past year, nobody would have imagined Maker Studios would sell for a billion dollars. A year ago, if you had told me Maker Studio was going to sell to Disney for a billion dollars, I would have laughed in your face. Now they're throwing away money all the time. People are buying MCNs and these channels left and right for nine digits. 500 million, 250 million for these networks and these shows. That is a huge, huge, huge deal. And it has drastically, drastically changed the environment like that. I mean, this is like climate change. If we're looking at the world, we've got millions of years of Earth, and now climate change. One year, boom, bam, everything's different. You've got Disney asking Bethany Moda to come on a show, and her saying, like, talk to my people. What? You were just on, like, two years ago. You were, Wow. And she passed because they wanted a quarter of a million for her to show up and do a cameo on a Disney show. I mean, this is where we are with the web and these creators that just a couple of years ago were sitting in their bedrooms, just like I'm doing. This isn't my bedroom. I don't sleep on a desk. But they're sitting here with these cameras looking at us. It has been a drastic, dramatic sea change. Now, how has that affected me personally? It hasn't. Oh, I say that just going out and saying it hasn't affected me because nothing has changed from where I am. I am still working. I am still producing. I am still trying really hard to make my stuff happen. What has changed is the access has become much more, in my opinion, like it was with traditional media going through the whole gatekeeper thing where you've got people who have money that want to make stuff and if you want to make stuff that's going to compete with what's out there right now, you have to get that money, you have to pitch them, they have to give you money, you have to get on a channel, you have to get on a network. It's really becoming very studio-centric right now, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's a sea change from where we were when Cell came out. When Cell came out, you could do anything you wanted. But the, the thing back then was there was no validation of the space. Now we've got a validation of the space. where We've got companies that see the value and are willing to put a 9 to 10 digit valuation on companies that are living in the space, and now there's this validation that, oh, wow, yeah, there's actually real value in that. Unfortunately, with that validation of the space comes the gatekeepers with the money. So we're really, in my opinion, getting in a position where people like me are becoming the independent filmmakers. That's a weird weird way to look at it, but there's the independent filmmakers and there's studio filmmakers. And if you're not in the studio system, you have to work it through the independent system. Am I rambling too much? No, 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 not at all. Actually, um, when I'd spoken to David Nett doing one of these, uh, he had a, you know, a similar opinion that there, it's going to be that sort of professional schism in between them. I, I likened what happened with web TV very much, you know, we were saying not even three or four years ago, it's the Wild West. You know, we kept we kept using historical analogies, but it, it feels more to me like we are past the Wild West. There's gold in them, there are hills. We're starting to very quickly reach the end of the gold rush, 
where, I mean, right now it's the gold rush. A billion dollars for Maker Studios is a gold rush. Uh, Legendary teaming up with Rocket Jump. Um, excuse me, Lionsgate teaming up with Rocket Jump. Legendary purchasing Geek and Sundry. Now they're getting ready to fund a Smosh film and they're working with those guys. This is the gold rush sort of boom period, and it feels, to, to when you bring up gatekeepers and stuff like that, it feels to me like the settlement of California. Everyone's rushed. Everyone's starting to claim their space, and now people are starting to sort of solidify the hold on their claims, and everything is starting to calm down into the very system that, in some cases, people escaped because it wasn't working for them, which is, you know, we had people that came to this space. I can't create in Hollywood. I'm not getting cast. My stuff isn't getting picked up. Um, so I'm going to make something here, and boom, it might hit. Uh, that kind of happened with Lisa Kudrow post-Friends with her web therapy. She wasn't really getting cast a lot. No one was really paying attention post-Friends. Web therapy hit, and you got to see more of Lisa Kudrow's personal style of comedy. And then she got picked back up by the machinery that she had sort of like, okay, I'm going to prove that it works. So for me, it just feels like we're in the settlement of California stage, and the good news, I agree with you completely. The space is getting validated now. It's not a joke. It's not some crappy little quaint thing where it's like, oh, that's precious. Um, you know, It's not like, oh, this is where Joss Whedon ran to when there was the, the writer's strike because he was going to do something no matter what. Now it's, hey, you can get work here. You can get jobs. Um, there's a thread in, uh, in the IWTV forum right now on Facebook where it was really cool to see Bernie Sue say, I have made a living off of creating and writing for this space since 2012. Um, but the flip side of that is more and more people are looking for the next Bernie Sue and that potential next Bernie Sue or that evolution of Bernie Sue is in the wings not getting attention because he's not already... Bernie. I mean, it's nothing to do with Bernie's fault. It goes back to your gatekeeper analogy, which is they want repeatable models of success, and so they're looking for that, and they're sort of missing what brought them to the fore in the first place, the, the sort of innovation at the bottom. So I, I'm rambling right along with you. I agree with you completely. Uh, it's great that we're valid now, but how frustrating is it that they want that stuff? And they're not looking for the new thing. They're looking for what's already succeeded because their psychological set is repeat the success, repeat the success over and over. Right. I think I think there is hope in that, though. Um, and the reason I say that is because, yeah, I think we are in a gold rush, quote-unquote, right now. There's a ton of money flowing. There's so much money flowing into the space right now. Um, and just an illustration of that, if five years ago I told somebody that I needed – $5,000 to make an episode of a web series, they would laugh in my face. You're like, that's ridiculous. But now you've got people whose budgets per series are 20000 100000 per episode. And that's okay. There are people that are willing to spend that money because they can finally see the return on their investment. We're really getting into mature space within here so that we can make it a sustainable business, which is important. I'm a creative guy, and I'm here for creative reasons, but at the same time, I get bills to pay. I got a mortgage. It's a thing. Um, exactly, yeah. The, the, uh, the illusion that like artists are only supposed to work for utopian free uh, is, is always something frustrating. Because it's like, yeah, we, we'd like to make a living trying to do this. We know how difficult it is and how competitive it is. But it's like, uh, we're not doing this for you know, just you know, shits and giggles. We're doing it for artistic satisfaction, and we're trying to make a living doing it. Right. Now, there is one thing, you know, going back to the whole Bethany Moda thing, and I wish I could remember where I read this article. It was a really recent article that was talking about it. It's, I saw some posts on it on Facebook or something. But they were talking about when Disney approached um, her to do this. I think I'm pretty sure it was Bethany Moda. I hope I'm not giving the wrong person here. If so, my apologies. Regardless, someone of that equal stature within the YouTube world was approached by Disney, came back with an offer. Disney said, whoa, we're not ready to spend that much. They went and they found people who would take less, and they got more engagement through that than they would have if they had spent all the money on Bethany Moda. So, yes, there's a gold rush, and there are big stars right now. The thing about this space is there's always new stars. There's still a chance. There's always a chance that you can get in there as long as you make good content and are willing to work hard and get out there and bust your tail. Never going to be easy 
but there's always going to be a chance. That's the great thing about the internet. You can get out there. That is as long as net neutrality is the thing. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's hope so. I I think it was over 1.7 million comments. Um, the FCC has tallied roughly by the time they close remarks. I was among those proudly. Oh yeah, me too. Me too. That's it's it is super important for me that this happens because it can mean the end of everything. I mean, how can a startup do anything on the internet if they have to pay extra cash just to get to the end user? It's extortion to me. It is the cable providers are extorting the businesses to get to their customers and it's not okay. They're already getting paid. The customers are paying them to get access to the internet. They don't get to decide who gets priority. That's not okay. That's the customers. They get to decide who wins in that battle and it's making me mad. That's why it should be a common carrier deal. Just in this Make it a common carrier. Everybody has a right. Get rid of these exclusive city contracts. Let's get some real competition in there. That's why we're going with Google Fiber when they launch in Austin at the end of the year because I'm not dealing with these big time orders and everything. Boom, soapbox, up, down, oh. Yeah, exactly. Hey, that's a sweet – well, and that, that's the biggest thing for me. Like, my biggest argument is you need competition. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what keeps prices down is companies that have to fight for customers and they have to consistently fight – to keep those customers happy. Because, I mean, we see, look at the recent stories about Comcast customer service, um, guys on hold for 20 days at a time, uh, AT&T customer service, there have been complaints and calls about that, and then, you know, now we're finally getting to the point where they're getting exposed because these are becoming viral posts and viral stories. Uh, and it just shows that when there's a lack of competition, you develop a hubris that negatively impacts your customers long term. Uh, so it's all about competition. Whatever we can do to get people to fight for customers and not just go, okay, well, this, this corridor, this northeast corridor is ours, and then you can have the southwest, and they'll go have the, and, you know, the industrial northwest and in Seattle, and we'll just give Microsoft their city. Uh, we just need to cut that stuff out. We've got to open it up and get the competition in there. They've got to fight for our dollars. Yep, I agree with you. agree with you completely. That's why, it's like, like I've said, so I'm going with Google Fiber. There it is. Google, you've just picked up a new future customer. Uh, you're around my area roughly, so whenever you get that Google Fiber stuff out here, you know, maybe I'll give you a look too. I'm just saying, you can pick up two new customers if you installed this shit today. Let's get it done. Right now. Right now. Right now, it's yeah. Coming. While we're waiting, we're Mark, and I, here, so. Mark and I will sign up for the accounts right now live if you just lay the fiber. Let's get this done. They actually laid it out in front of our house. Nice. All right. Yeah. We're just waiting. We had a guy out here. He couldn't say he was Google Fiber, but he asked we had heard of him. He was like, yes. He was like, oh, well, that's a good thing. I was like, oh, so you're <laughs> good. Turn it on. Turn it on. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Where, where's the dip switch? Where's the cord that I pull to get the engine running on the Google Fiber? All I need, man. Just throw me a line. So a question that that's just occurred to me um, when talking about the sort of gold rush right now. Are we hitting a point where we're at a boom period, or is there a risk that, at least in your opinion, that maybe we're approaching a bubble? Because booms are good, bubbles are not good. Oh, wow. I don't know if I've ever thought of it as possibly being a bubble. I only, um, you know, I only brought it up because I was thinking about the dot-com bubble uh, in the early 2000s, and where it was just like lightning, and it went up, and then just like light, you know, the end of the flash, it went up, and the uh, what was that? The PetSmart dog um, yeah. basically was sold uh, some company for a dollar and a ham sandwich. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, you know, I I don't really see. I do think that we're in a boom time right now, just because there is a ton of money that is going to the top producers out there. I mean, everybody's making deals when. When CAA and UTA and all these people get involved with YouTubers, you know that there's something happening. So we are in a boom. This stuff is happening. I don't think it's a bubble because bubble implies to me that the talent we're seeing here is overvalued. And I don't believe that it's overvalued. I believe that it has been so undervalued with the reach and the power of the engagement that these creators actually bring to the table. I think that what we're really seeing now is a correction that's getting more to what the real value of these creators is. Um, a bubble would be like, oh, I've got, I can tell one person something cool and they're going to give me a million dollars. That's overvalued. But these people have significant power 
to move people and motivate action. And that has been tremendously undervalued for years now. I think we're just now getting to the point where the real value is starting to be recognized. And I don't even think we've seen the, the front end of that yet. Because if you look, CPMs are still crap. Everybody knows you can't make money off of a CPM from it. We still don't have the advertisers that agree with the value. They still haven't changed their mindset that an engaged audience is better than just a sheer volume audience. They haven't changed that yet, but you still have the brands that are willing to invest significant dollars directly to creators to have that level of engagement. So I think we're in a boom. I don't think it's a bubble. I think we're going to keep seeing it grow because I think we're finally seeing the true value of this stuff. Uh, yeah, I can see it. In a way, it's more like it's it's starting to um, equalize. You know, finally, that effect that reached that value is being seen, and now there as the as the bigger companies actually sort of compete with each other to lock down that engagement. That's why they're rushing in to be like, okay, we need to look at what vloggers or channels affect our the audience we're looking for, and go 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 go. Yep. Absolutely. It's uh, it's going to be interesting, and it's going to get more interesting, too, because with these, there are going to be more competitors to YouTube starting up over the next few years, and the more these competitors get out there, the more I think we're going to see these CPMs start to creep up, because people are really going to be fighting for this money. Um, could be wrong, but that's what I think. Well, I mean, YouTube uh, recently started their own crowdfunding system. Um, because of what they felt they were losing to the crowdfunding sites in trying to keep people on the YouTube platform. So that started recently. YouTube's already trying to adapt to things that are starting to ding them, uh, which is which is great in the end, but I definitely would love to see CPMs start to creep up a little bit, especially when it's like, hey, I have X million views and I can pay rent for two months. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's got it. There's got to be a fix, and there are still some tech things that need to figure out. You know, what's the true value of a view as opposed to a, a full impression? I mean, it's there's a lot of stuff that goes on with that that the advertisers are reasonably concerned about. Sure. But I think that we're breaking through that. Um, I if hope a bear clicks on a video in the woods, did it actually watch it? Exactly. Or did it just wander off and make a sandwich? Exactly. Uh, speaking of which, I'm kind of hungry, Mark, so I'll be right back. No, I'm kidding. So we were talking about some YouTube personalities, um, and you're actually working with some personalities yourself. How did we go from uh, the the narrative series of Weird Girls into the the vlog pyre um, that you are the emperor and royal vizier of right now? How did, how did we bridge that gap? You're putting a lot of pressure on my shoulders. I'm feeling. I'm weird. just saying. I'm picturing you and like uh, like Ming the Merciless from Flash Gordon, like a sweet cape with like the high neck and everything. It's pretty cool. I only wear that on Sundays. As long as you have the ring and the Max von Sydow laugh, I'll take it. Oh yeah, but again, only on Sundays. Um, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of weird because it really boiled down to what I learned from Cell and from what I learned watching this space. And I basically developed my own little theory that I am actively testing out. We'll see if it works, but it's my theory. Um, Basically, there's a few ways I looked at it. There's the business side and there's a creative philosophical side of things. From a business side of things, um, a scripted series costs a lot of money to make. Not only that, it costs a lot of money to promote that series when it comes out. Now, with a digital series, which I'm going to call an original series because I agree that I'm not going to call it web series anymore. I hate that term. I always have. Um, for an original series, I have to spend money engaging people upon launch. Once I am done with my season of content, I start losing engagement. I make a second season. I come back. I launch it. I have to re-engage, which means I need to spend more money to re-engage that audience. I've lost that audience. I have got to re-engage them. The online originals world is such so that unless you have a consistent marketing budget going, you will lose viewers if you take hiatus. That's just the way it works. So from a business standpoint, I decided that I needed to keep my audience engaged between seasons. The best way for me to do that is to do a lower cost 
type of programming that would appeal to the viewers. So if you like the show Weird Girls, you're probably going to like comic books. So we have a show about comic books. You're probably going to have some interest in cosplay. We're going to do a show about cosplay. Video games, we have a show about video games. So whoever that audience is, that personality is going to be reflected in these other shows that can continue and can continue to engage that audience in between seasons. So from a business standpoint, to me, it's a way to save money in the long term. Yeah, basically it's a way to keep momentum all the way through with whatever it's going to take you through the process. Right. Exactly. So what what exactly brought what brought you to the idea to to put that theory into practice? Is it something you had seen um done somewhere else? Is it something you just you know you took bits and pieces from other executions you'd seen and put them together? What was I'm always curious what 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 was the uh, aha moment? What was the epiphany? Uh you know I don't know. I'm not sure what what the exact will like what was that moment where I said this is what I need to do? I'm not sure what that moment was. There was a lot that went into it. Part of it was the success of lower cost shows like um, Lizzie Bennett and things like that. And and I actually started working on this before Lizzie Bennett shot Frame One. Um, I had been talking with a bunch of people, kind of playing around with this concept, trying to get things together, working on ways to make this happen. Um, it still am, but seeing the success of that, and actually I've had a lot of conversation with Bernie Sue about this and some other creators. And one of the big things that led to the success of Lizzie Bennett and the way they've been able to support it is it is a low-cost show. They shoot a lot at once. They get a ton of bang for their buck when they do that show. Same thing with Emma Approved. Um, all of the shows at Pimberly Digital have that very simple formula of really getting a lot of bang for your buck whenever you shoot something. So they're able to keep their costs down low, and they're able to make a return on that. So if I have a moderate return on a tiny cost, I get to bring more of that home. If I've got a moderate return on a high cost, I'm still losing money on the deal. So looking at that, knowing that I am a scripted creator that wants to make the bigger productions, there's got to be a way to balance that out. So if I make a bigger production, which from what I've seen, in my opinion, can tend to drive a lot, a lot, a lot of subscriptions and loyal engagement, I can supplement that higher cost with the lower cost videos that are very personal that also have just as much ability to drive a lot of loyalty and personal engagement. When you look at them two together, you have your net cost of what it's going to be, and they balance themselves out. Making sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and it's now, a theory. Uh, well, and it's, it's I, a theory. Should, theory. You can try a hypothesis. It. This is the test of the hypothesis. I like it. This is this is some Neil deGrasse Tyson style original series content creation. I like it. There you go. It's a good way to look at it. I like it. Neil it, Tyson. It, it's Mark's part. It's Mark's theory. He can try if he wants to. Try if he wants to. Try if. He, oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. Um, sorry. It happens. I, I parodies happen with me. Parodies happen. Damn. Um. So, do you think it's going to be? Do you think one or the other will sort of be a catalyst more? You know, was one of them going to be a key catalyst for you? Um, or does it really feel like um, two different sets of audiences that you'll be able to sort of bring together under your scripted material and the vlogging material? You know, I really do feel like they're synergistic. Um, I think that the scripted stuff has a subset of people that are really going to be into it. Actually, I think it's a pretty big subset because I really, I really love these scripts. I haven't loved scripts as much in a long time, and I really love these scripts. Um, but I also, the the vloggers that I'm working with who have come in and have started vlogging on the Weird Girls channel, they're amazing, and they really engage with their viewers too. I mean, we had a panel at RTX, and it was great seeing the number of people there who were coming up and saying, oh, my God, I love your stuff. We watch your stuff all the time. We love you guys. Ah, it, was, it was amazing. So I think that those people, when a scripted thing happens, they're going to support that scripted thing, and the people who discovered the scripted series, when they see what else we're doing, they're going to vibe with that as well. I really do feel that it's a synergistic thing. I think we're going to see bumps through everything once we're able to get it all together. See, I'm always I'm always a fan of the balanced approach because I generally find that they're the most they're the most successful over a long term. 
you can have that quick spike from a, a small term event. Um, but when you take it, you know, the, the people that look at the long game generally seem to just have more uh, success. And it's the internet, it's very hard to do the long game. I mean, we're very focused on that video that week, that view count, that et cetera, et cetera. News stories are moving through so quickly all the time. Um, you know, today, well, at least currently, unfortunately, we have modern uh, breaking tragic news, things like. Um, very frustrating Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn stuff going on. Just all that kind of nastiness, but at the same time, it goes so fast. I mean, if this were even four or five years ago, this stuff would be discussed more, but now it's just like, okay, four to seven days of this white hot, and then, oh, something else happened. Let's go over there. Um, and, and so to see people take the long view it looks to me like that long view will succeed. It's just you're not you're, you're not being trained, or at least it's not being reinforced to take a long view. It's just about do something now, 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 now. Right, and that's I'm really fighting against that. And the reality is, if I had wanted to, I could have slapped together weird girls, and I could have figured out a way to make it work and shoot it. Somehow, I would have changed the script. I would have changed the locations. I would have changed what we were doing. I would have scaled back what I was trying to do. But would you have been satisfied? Like, no. I mean, would you have been satisfied with that? No, I wouldn't have been satisfied because that's not the story I want to tell. Now, some people are going to say, "Oh, would you have to make sacrifices?" Well, yes, I'm making sacrifices for years. I'm still making sacrifices. Um, the fact that I haven't produced anything actively as a web series for the past three years professionally has hurt me. Um, professionally. For me to continue to grow as a writer and director in this industry, I need to get shit out there. And the fact that I have not done that on purpose, the fact that I have said, no, I'm not going to do that, this is a project that actually means a lot to me, and I'm not going to compromise that, what I want it to be, um, it's hurt me professionally, and it's a huge risk for me to do it. Um, at the same time, kind of like you said, I see this project as having the ability to be self-sustaining over the long run. And that's important to me. If I jump in and do it now, I sacrifice my ability to support it in the long term. If I wait and I do it right, then I have the chance to turn this into something that can continue on for hopefully years and years and years. Because I've got about five seasons worth of Weird Girls in my gut right now. so. You know, that's kind of a weird place to keep scripts, Mark. I'm not gonna lie. It's safe. The cloud. It's not secure. Oh yeah, yeah. We know that. Yeah. Thanks a lot, cloud. Wow. Um. So how much how much of your long term view was influenced by one of your contemporaries uh, in the Texas scene, in the Austin, Texas scene, uh, Mr. Bernie Burns, the other Bernie, um, creating Rooster Teeth. Uh, Red versus Blue is what most people know it from um, from the beginning. Uh, they have a bunch of different shows, and it's culminated into the creation, the, the upcoming creation of their feature film, Laser Team. But how much has that been in your neighborhood relatively? How much has that sort of influenced um, or sort of given you uh, like a hope or a confidence of being able to work towards a goal in, a, in that sort of sphere? Um, the influence that Bernie Burns has had on me has been immeasurable, honestly. Um, the man knows the space. The man is brilliant. What they've built with Rooster Teeth is pretty amazing. Um, now, yeah, they started before anybody. I mean, the, before the YouTubes, before anything, they were out there and they started. And if you ask Bernie how to be successful now, he'll tell you to start in 2006. And he's, he's pretty accurate in that. Oh. Um, but having said that, um, the way that they have built things up really has structured the way I look at everything I'm trying to do and build myself. Um, and I don't, I shouldn't say everything, but I definitely listen, watch, pay attention, adapt, and steal when necessary. Um, whenever, whenever they do something great, I'm like what they did, what they did. And they've got a great, great business together. And I would love to get to the point where I can do that. I would love to have productions that are constantly running. I want to get to that point 
where we have this constantly shooting productions. We've got new things shooting all the time. I want this to be a production house, which is why I'm not willing to put Weird Girls out as a show and say, here's my show, uh, hire me to do stuff. No, that's not, that's not the end goal here. The end goal is like, here's something that I produced, help me produce more kind of thing. And unless you have the foundation to support that, it's not going to work. So I'm building the foundation. It's taking a long time, not going to lie driving me crazy, but um, building that strong foundation to me is the most important part, and I do look to Rooster Teeth a lot for, you know, inspiration, if you will. I think it's a good word. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm very much the same way. Like, the, the, the two models that I admire the most uh, were Freddie Wong and Brandon Lash um, and Bernie Burns. Like, that, both models, because they, they came up it's not like they came up from nowhere. It's not like they picked up a, a computer keyboard and a mouse off the street one day and then suddenly invent, you know, Bernie Burns didn't go, hey, what is this? It's a movie camera. Wow, I can do stuff. Um, he didn't pick up an Xbox. But the way that they developed it from the ground up, they built a foundation, they built a fan base with that foundation, um, and then they just they kept going and going, and they did it without... The, there's nothing wrong with the with the sort of tendency or the impulse to want to sell to a bigger group. Um, the, the most recent example actually is in gaming. Notch um, and and Mojang sold Minecraft to Microsoft, and there are a lot of people that you know were wringing their hands and like, oh, here comes the the death of Minecraft. But I respect Notch a lot because he basically said it got too big for me. And there's too much pressure and too much stress in wanting to uphold my ideals to make sure that all of you guys are... And it wasn't like, oh my god, I'm running away, I quit. And he had no problems with his audience. He didn't you know, have any issues with them. He was just big enough to admit, this has gotten too big for me. Uh, and I can't do it in a way that I think is going to be satisfactory to myself, that I think is respecting my audience, and so I'm going to sell. So when, I, when you see... Um, you know, Freddie spun off, you know, Freddie W evolved and, you know, broke off into Rocket Jump. Now Brandon's doing gaming. Um, and Bernie Burns built Rooster Teeth from Red vs. Blue. And not only did he build it, Rooster Teeth is his, and he's maintained it, and he's grown it, and he keeps expanding. And it's not, you know, the I'm sure Bernie Burns has gotten offers for Rooster Teeth. I would, my mind would be blown in a trillion pieces if, if there was some way that no one had tried to buy Rooster Teeth. But I think it speaks to, he understands the value of the IP, of the intellectual property. And to me, intellectual property is the gold of the 21st century. Um, we've found at just about every element we're going to need to do things anymore. The technology we need is very much getting boiled down into very a small group of technology we need and innovation is getting harder and harder to come by. But ideas, that's where everything needs to be controlled. And we see that by Disney purchasing Marvel, Disney purchasing Star Wars. Uh, they didn't build a competing science fiction brand. They, you know, they didn't build a competing comic book company. They just said, we're taking, you know, we're going to own those ideas because we know the value in them. So for Bernie to, you know, Bernie must see there's long-term value in Rooster Teeth being mine, and I'm gonna keep running it and growing it. Those the, the the Rocket Jump and Rooster Teeth models are very much the two I admire most um, in creation content from this level. I mean, the other side, as we mentioned before, Kevin Spacey going to Netflix and saying, "I dare you to give me a hundred million bucks to remake House of Cards, and I'm gonna blow your socks off." That's different because he came from success already in the filmmaking world. Uh, but to see creating wacky things with game footage from Halo, um, to see USC film students use After Effects to make action comedy videos that captured people in a way nothing else had been captured, to me that's, that's magical. I mean, there's no other word to describe it. It is simply magical that it happened. And I would love to be able to try and build something in a similar vein, um, you know, up here in Michigan, because they, for me, that's the model I want. That's the model I shoot for. Well, I think that's that's a good way to look at it. I mean, and, um, you know, another thing that I'm holding off on, you know, again, I say that I could have shot 
weird girls. I could have begged for people to work for free. I could have cashed in more favors, even though I cashed them all in to get cell finished. Um, I could do that, but I'm not helping myself in the long term because in the long term for me, I need to have an industry in Austin that can support a production class. If I'm never paying anybody, they're going to leave. I need people here, which means I need to pay crew. I need to pay cast. I cannot tell you how many people I worked with on sell who have moved to California. It's ridiculous. It's, it's insane. So if I want to have long-term success building something here in Austin, I have got to pay people so that they can make a living. So I'm not going to shoot weird girls until I can pay people. I may not be their full rate. I would love to go with full union on this. I'll probably have to stick with the low budget digital kind of contracts right now. Maybe at some point we'll get there. But if I can't pay people enough so that they're, they can stay here and not leave, then I'm just shooting myself in the foot and I'm constantly chasing my tail trying to find more people to work with who are talented, who can get the quality stuff we need to make. So... Work in the long game. Yeah, and you know it's a similar thing here. When I did my um, campaign, as we were getting towards the end of it, I had people that were like, "Well, you should try, you know, like Indiegogo and stuff like that, where you can, you know, where you can keep um, whatever it is you you get pledged." But I'm like, I can't. That's not going to work for this for the apotheosis pilot. I need to be able to do it all the way, or I don't do it. It's not something, you know, it, it's not something we can shoot. Only on weekends. It's not, you know, the, the projects evolved. It's not the thing you can shoot on off days or when you have a day off or any of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I'm trying to move it into a, a bigger direction. And I completely agree with and sympathize with your situation. I want to make it right the first time. I don't want the knockoff version. I don't want to make, you know, um, the the sort of uh, like experimental version of apotheosis that it could be this. I want to make you know that pilot, and in order to make that pilot, this is what it costs to make that pilot. And yeah, I've cut my cost as best as I can, but it still it costs substantial amounts of money to do it. Um, and a lot of people just they sort of see those numbers and they're just thinking like, oh, it just goes into Mark Gardner and James Fernandez bag with the dollar sign written on it, um, you know. And it's like, oh, why should I give you? And it's like, well, you're not giving me. You know, for my budget was twenty five grand to do my pilot. You're not giving me twenty five thousand anything. My business entity, I cut myself a paycheck, uh, and I cut a paycheck for every other person acting, running a camera, uh, the, the the contract with whoever we do with craft services. Everyone else, this is a job for everyone else. And I really think I don't know about you, but I think there's that sort of disconnect where they don't they don't see that part of the machinery sometimes. And so they wonder, why does it cost so much? Well, it's not because I'm giving myself $22,000 and spending the rest on the show. Yeah, no. I mean, if, you, if you're... I don't know how long... I drop stuff. I don't know how long your, your shoe is going to be for your pilot, but the reality is if you have a crew, if you have actors, if you have things going on, it costs money. You, I mean, these people have to eat at the end of the day. They have to pay their mortgages as well. There's, there's a significant amount of money here. This isn't just going out there. And, and I think it actually goes with a more societal thing that devalues the artistic side of life. Um, if they don't see an immediate monetary, like if they don't see the Hunger Games made five bajillion dollars, oh, that's a valid artistic pursuit. If they don't see those kind of numbers, then they don't associate it with real value in an artistic endeavor. So when you say, I'm making a show, we're going to do this, but they're not seeing the return. They're not seeing the money that's made from that. And until they see that, they devalue that creative. They only see value in the creative when the creative makes money, period. And it's frustrating. This is my personal opinion, my philosophies. But I think it's valid. Um, I can't tell you how many of my family have still never seen Cell. And they'll still come up to me every once in a while and be like, how's that web thing you're doing? That's that thing you do. Yeah, I've gotten that myself. I've gotten that myself. So I'll make a movie that makes $100 million, and I will never get that question again. Ever. And it's just, it's just really based on the value of creative. Unless it's making money, 
people don't value it. A bandwagon effect, if you will. If you will. And it's interesting because, I mean, if you look at it uh, with your earlier statements with the, the, the gatekeeper system that's, that's developing in the space, I mean, it, it's like the, the, the people that have control of the purse strings are using that exact philosophy. Well, it can't make money unless it already made money. It's like the ultimate catch-22. Um, you know, you can't, well, I mean, this show could be a hit, but have you already made a hit? No? Well, I'm not interested in what you're selling over here. Uh, have you had a hit already? Why, yes. Oh, okay, well then come on in. You know, let's let's see what we can do for you. Right. So from your point of view, um, does it feel like had timing worked out and your the, pro, the sort of gestation process for weird girls and, and developing pilot scripts, do you think if it would have come a little closer or at least if cold cast had stayed around longer, do you think that would have helped your cause? Do you think you would have had at least a little more cachet with the purse strings that frustrate you? Or does it feel like that wouldn't have changed just because of how quickly the landscape evolved? Um, I, I honestly don't think that cold cast sticking around much longer would have helped with this. Um, this is a... The, the project, the Weird Girls project as a whole is a big project. I'm not going to lie. It is a big project. It is... Um, I mean, budget-wise, it's kind of like a Reese project kind of thing, looking at web terminology for people who don't know recent series, old series from a few years back, when sci-fi briefly disappeared. Um, it's, it's that level, and I don't think that having sell out a little longer would do it. I think I would need to have a bigger mainstream hit, something that had hit on YouTube. Um, and I've actually been encouraged to make something that is smaller, more accessible, that can still show the scripted side of everything. And I'm actually working on stuff like that. We're actually, actually after my last script to LA, I had some very good conversations with some producers out there, and um, I'm actually revamping the prospectus to find different people to pitch to. And there's, I'm actually rewriting some characters in there to specifically go towards certain audiences. So um, I don't think that cold casts would have helped I think that it's just a tough sell, you know, having four middle school girls fighting demons. How many years did it take Joss Whedon to get that thing taken up? I mean, and he's Joss Whedon. Yeah, exactly, yeah, from 18 years old and uh, getting a script bought out of, you know, and then disappearing, not so much disappearing, but just sort of working on the ground levels until, oh, let, eh, let's make it a series, let's see what it does, let's see if this Joss Whedon guy can do something. And now he owns the Marvel Universe. Yeah, the cinematic universe, absolutely. And right. uh, Warner Brothers and DC are doing their best to make sure that they do everything the opposite that Joss Whedon did. <laughs> um, no fun, over-serious, way too stuffed with, like, crap all the time, and it's going to be the best. It's going to be the best. I like Dark. Don't get me wrong. I like Dark, but I like to laugh every once in a while, too. Uh, yeah, I, I always thought it, I found it very weird when there was the, the stories out about DC basically like humor is persona non grata in our JLA films. And it's just like, wow, I can't wait to see more Superman crying over the fact he's the uh, uh, insanely powerful Kryptonian and Ben Affleck grumbling about how he's an old man, an old Batman, and he's too old for this shit. Like, it's just, it's going to be, I don't know, it's kind of weird. Um, Green Lantern didn't fail because it was funny. It failed because they tried to stuff 40 years of comic book continuity into a, a, a feature-length film and then wondered why no one got it. Um, and then why Green Lantern fans detested it. It's because I didn't want to read 300 issues of Green Lantern in two hours. Like I, I want to go along for the ride, too. Well, and I think that's the, the way that Marvel has succeeded is they've taken the bigger picture approach from all these things and they have over their however many movies we've got in the cinematic universe since Iron Man came out. Eight movies? Are we at eight now? Nine? Something like that? I think so, yeah. One, two, three, one, two, two. Yeah, I think so. Eight. Yeah, so with all of these movies that they've got out, they have, through creating this intertwined cinematic universe, been able to throw so many references out there to obscure parts of comic history more modern parts of the comic book history, and they have really been able to address all the hardcore fans while making it accessible to people who have never read a comic book in their life. 
I mean, that's that's the way you got to do it. You have to play to both sides of that coin. Why is DC not looking at this going like, oh, maybe we should invest in the long term here? This sounds like the conversation we were having a minute ago about taking the long path to get your things done. And it's ironic because it's 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 like their TV and their film divisions aren't even talking. Their yeah, their television. I really love their television model. Gotham, yes. The Flash, uh, Smallville. Um, Arrow, and that I'm glad they finally fixed Arrow into just being the, oops, we're not allowed to have Batman. Let's throw in Oliver Queen as a young billionaire orphan industrialist who stalks the night. Oh, that, that was amazing. I was glad that they did their 180 and they made him back into Oliver Queen uh, and not just the not-quite-Batman they did in Smallville. That was refreshing. Uh, you know what? I, I, I never really watched Smallville, so... Well, it, it was, long story short, they were about to have Bruce Wayne in Smallville. It was the big event that was supposed to happen. They were going to have Bruce Wayne and then Diana of Demisera. And then at the last minute, Warner Brothers Corporate was getting ready to do, um, like, Batman Begins. And so their decree was, we're not going to have simultaneous um, Bruce Waynes in two different media, which is ironic because they're doing that now with The Flash. But we're not going to have two different Bruce Waynes. And so... The scripts were already written for Bruce Wayne to start, you know, doing business deals with Lex Luthor. It was between Wayne Industries and LexCorp. And the, the writers of Smallville were like, all right, we have to change this. And so at the last minute, it became Oliver Queen. But if you watch the if you watch the Smallville episodes, Oliver Queen was obviously not quite Bruce Wayne. His entire backstory, everything was presented, and it was like 80%, 90% Bruce Wayne, 10% Ollie Queen. Uh, so when they actually did Arrow itself, they eventually fixed that, and they did the shipwreck, and they did his time alone and all that. But their TV and film divisions just don't communicate. They're, I love the television. Uh, it's getting a lot better. And their films are just like, let's put out a new JLA movie every three months for two years straight, I think is what their schedule says right now. Um, like clockwork, so it just it, it blows my mind. It absolutely blows my mind. Maybe they can pull it off. Who knows? I well, know. we'll see. I mean, Man of Steel, the first seventy-five percent of Man of Steel, I loved. It was just the last act that killed the. For me personally, the last act is what blew the movie for me. Was it the uh, Was it the um, Superman's last action there that killed it for you, or was it just? It wasn't. It really wasn't that. What it was for me was they really built up. You know, my favorite of the first um, Avengers solo films was actually Captain America because the movie was about Steve Rogers. It was not about a costume, a shield, and stars and stripes. Right. Um. And so when they built up Man of Steel. It was more appealing to see, you know, I thought it was going to be much more Nolanized, Nolanized and it was to a point where it was about Kal-El of Krypton living and growing up in this world as an alien, and, you know, he, he's an adopted human being. And I really love the fact that it was, he was always wanting to help people and save people, and his dad, you know, Pa Kent was like, look, if you expose who you are, you're in danger, and I won't allow that to happen to my child. And his retort was, but dad, if I can save people, why don't I? Right. And so the, the problem is the fourth act, suddenly it just went to like Iron Man 1 into the last act of Avengers in the span of one minute. And it was just like, boom, the world is blowing up and Zod is changing everything in the universe and Superman is uppercutting skyscrapers and smashing all this. And the, the, the moment I started to turn on the film was when Superman bowling ball through Zod through a gas station that clearly had people in it and blew it up. Not because he had to, but because Zod was talking shit about his mommy. <laughs> you, you remember that scene? I don't, but he made me want to watch it back right it was, now. Yeah, it was, in, it was in Kansas where Zod is like approaching like Ma Kent's house in Kansas. Uh -huh. And they do the first sort of like battle where Zod doesn't understand that being exposed to the sunlight, or the, the yellow radiation. So Superman literally bowling ball throws him across the ground, and he slides all the way clear through a gas station where cars are parked at the gas station. And he hits the gas pumps after blowing through the convenience store. And the whole station goes up. And Zod walks out with his badass thing, and Superman's all angry. And I realized that the kid who wanted to save people in the last 30 flashbacks 
blew up a gas station with people in it. And it just it kept going from there. And so it was just the Zack Snyder, I need to blow up everything scale, just kind of threw it all off from what they were building. I expected a fight with him and Zod. Yeah. I didn't expect them to be throwing right crosses through skyscrapers and blowing up a trillion dollars of real estate in Superman's first fight. Just his first one. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I see that. And I, I, I can agree that I think they may have gone a little too big at the end, especially because they had, there were some moments in the first part of the film that I really thought were well done. Like, I really, really loved the part where he, like, locked himself in the closet at school because he couldn't not hear everything going on around him and everything like that. To me, that was a really cool moment that really could get you into what it's like to be Superman. That's the kind of stuff I was hoping to see more of. And by the end of it, it was, let me just eat some popcorn and I'll watch stuff blow up. Yeah, you know, and I like, cause it, th that scene I like, because they, they showed you the vulnerabilities of the invulnerable man. And that's why I was, like, those first three acts were great, because it's like, here are the vulnerabilities of being Kal-El. Mm -hmm. Um... I really people didn't like it. I liked when he was the vagrant. I liked the fact that he was like Bruce Banner or David Banner in the show is what they called. But I like the idea that he's just like I'm just going to do this because he knows that people are going to notice these things and eventually Lois did. But I liked the fact that he was just a bum going around and trying to help people because that's what he wanted to do from his childhood. Yeah. So just when they did the whole, oh, we're going to fight Zod in Metropolis and blow up 40% of it and do all that stuff, it just felt like they skipped a bunch of things yeah, uh, just yeah. to get to the action. And it, Superman had killed before, you know, but it's just, the way it, they did it, it was like, Mer. It, it's like they built him up to be really sympathetic as a character early on, but then at the very end, he lost all sympathy. It's like he really turned on this thing. He was like, oh, I'm Superman. Yeah, and even in the comics, they would always have the panel, like Superman's in a big fight with, you know, Metallo, and there's always that scene where he's pushing the car up over like some old couple or something, and he's trying to get them to safety. And it's just one little panel. Yeah. Uh, and I would have liked that. One 10, 12, 30-second shot of Superman preventing someone from getting killed by debris, telling them to get out, trying to clear him out. And there was none of that. It was just gritting his teeth and throwing more punches at Zod. Um, and it was just it was frustrating because they built it up so well. Right. And then when they try to say that the JLA comes from this film and they can't explain how the other six members ignored this entire event, just leads back into DC, doesn't understand what they're doing with their movies. Well, we'll see soon. Yeah, we will. I can't wait to see Arthur going, yeah, all my oceans were being polluted, and I was like, man, I should probably look into that. <laughs> um, and then two years later, I did. And uh, wow, God, I guess it was you. You were part of the problem. So bringing us back to, to Joss Whedon, um, because with you, you, you your vlog pyre, um, your, your, your sort of stable of vloggers, uh, all women, uh, they're all very cool. Like I, I haven't seen, I haven't watched every single bit of everything, but I'm personally, I'm a Kelly Nova fan. Um, I'm liking Kelly Nova stuff. Uh, Danny Danger is part. Go ahead, take us through the roster. Who's your current roster of vloggers at this point? Um, well, we started off, we actually started off with McKenna, who actually went to Wonderleaf, which was a uh, full screen, big frame, big frame, full screen, one of them. Uh, they kind of took her, so she left. Uh, Danny Danger was my second. She's, now she does all comic books. Kelly Nova started later. She focuses on cosplay. She does a ton of closet cosplays. Like, I need a costume. Here's something I can pull together cheap, quick, from my house kind of thing, which is really fun. I don't know anybody else that's doing that much of that right now. I think it's really cool. Um, then we've got Jedi Amanda, who is a cosplayer that we met online, and she is in Kentucky. She does all of her stuff from Kentucky, um, and she focuses on Disney, on puppetry, and animation and stuff like that. We recently got Zombie on board. Zombie does gaming. She does Let's Play videos. I love Zombie's Let's Plays, and I don't really like a lot of Let's Play videos. Because, like, she did one for a game called Papers, Please, where you're basically a, um, you're at a border checkpoint of this Cold War kind of town. So she, like, dressed up, like, full, like, Russian hat, ear flaps down, spoken right. Russian accent the entire time she was doing this. Like, Hello, welcome to Rostovska. What can I do for you the entire time? It was, it was awesome. I loved it. And uh, the newest contributor we have is Chandler Baker, and she's a young adult author that has come on, and she's starting to talk about books. 
And her actual her first book, they just had the cover reveal. Her book with Disney Hyperion is coming out soon. They did the cover reveal on the 15th, so just a few days ago. So really excited to have her on. She does book reviews, book hauls, and things like that. So that's the stable. Um, we've got a few people that do some printed stuff on occasion just for the website that'll review music and authors and things like that. Um, they show up every once in a while. I'm hoping to get more people to do some of the written work as well. And we're always looking for more people that are wanting to jump in and help and be a part of the channel. Um, because I personally, I have a lot of varied interests. I am interested in a lot of different things. So I like being able to just sit down and go like, watch. And I'm going to see all of these things that I'm interested in. I'm interested in video games. I'm interested in cosplay. I'm interested in comics. I'm interested in it all. So the more people we can get on there, the happier I am. And what I'm, I'm noticing is... Um, probably one of the coolest things from a sort of sociological standpoint is that I'd say in the past decade, women are finally exerting their influence on markets uh, of all types. And we're seeing it a lot more. It's coming into the entertainment markets in all of its different forms, which has been relatively, I'd say about six or seven years. It's not that they were never playing these games, but now they're they're finally at a point where they're you know it's not something to where it's like their quiet hobby or something they don't really bring up. They're they're vocal, they're excited, they're participating, they're coming into the market. Um, does it feel like that increased participation and influence in the market is what's helping drive this boom period? Um, yes, I think that's that's a very interesting question. Um, yes, I do think that that is having some kind of, and I don't even know if I would call it a boom period, because I feel like that there's a lot of discussion and a lot of change, but when you really look at the numbers and when you really look at um, the representation and the percentage representation and the percentage participation in all of these things, it's still vastly outnumbered and heavily weighted against the female demographic, um, vastly. So it's hard for me to say a boom when I still, like when I was doing um, written stuff on the website and I used to write a lot of reviews and recaps and everything, I really wanted to make a concerted effort to mostly focus the women that were participating in these shows. And do you know how hard it was to find official pictures from TV shows on major networks that had the female leads in them? It's really hard to do. And this is still now. This is today. And this was a year ago that I'm looking for these pictures. So I, I, boom sounds wrong to me. I think that what we're seeing right now is more of just a recognition of what's going on and what is out there. Um, if we start to see more representation and more of an equal footing in the industries and the media that we see, that I might consider a boom. But I don't see that yet. When you've got Assassin's Creed that won't put a female character in their game because it's too hard to animate, that's a problem. That's not a boom for me. That should be the default. The default for anybody making a game that's like that, that has customizable characters, you should be able to choose a female. Now, some of them it doesn't always work. Some of them you have narrative games, like The Walking Dead. That doesn't work the same if you play The Walking Dead as a different character. That is designed for a character, and that's a yeah. Different it's it's specifically Rick Grimes, you know. Yeah, not not Rochelle Grimes, exactly. Right, exactly. Um, but when you're talking about games like Skyrim, or you're talking about games like Assassin's Creed, or Dragon Age, or whatever, um, those games where you can really immerse yourself into that, for these companies to just now be saying like, oh, I guess we should have more women. Well, no shit, no shit. You should have more women. Uh, there's a great video that came out recently that. Um, basically switch some of the gender roles and they showed what it would be like if men had to live like women live. And like one of the most interesting things that I saw, and they had all these different illustrations of it, like, you know, they had an Avengers poster where every Avenger was a woman and there was a guy going like, what? okay. Um, but the most interesting thing I saw was they had a picture of a little kid, like a little like eight or ten year old kid, elementary school kid, that was looking up at a big poster of all the presidents of the United States, and they were all women. And it was just like, 
I'm not sure I ever looked at it like that, but I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to get it. Until we get that kind of equal representation in our culture, I'm not going to call it a boom. I think we're just starting to recognize what we're living in. All right, all right. That's no, that's fair. I like that. Um, does it feel, from your point of view, it feels like it to me, but it, it, speaking of you know innovation and competition, does it feel like um, new ideas and new approaches are being sort of pumped into the system, something new in a, in a good way to compete against? Does it feel like... Um, you know, does it feel like they're retreading things that have been successful before? Uh, what, is it, what does it feel like to you? Um, I, uh, that's tough. That's tough. I think that there are some positive signs that there are some things that are changing. Um, well, heck, the uh, redesign of Batgirl, the Babs Tar Batgirl redesign that's coming out recently is amazing. I mean, wow, all of a sudden... You've got this amazing Batgirl who, wow, that's a functional outfit that is actually what some teenage girl would wear and that you can run around in and you can kick butt in. Wow, that's amazing. That is not a spandex lycra thing that has these weird vacuum-packed chess pieces or anything yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, I know. That, that, to me, is great. But we still have Marvel saying there's not going to be a Black Widow movie. I mean, where are we at? We've got so many people that are asking for this. Yeah, there's going to be a Peggy Carter show. Great. There's also going to be a Flash and a Daredevil. And how many other shows out there are focused on the men in the Marvel Universe? But we've struggled to get a Peggy Carter show. There's going to be Alias. So there's Alias. There's Peggy Carter. What else we got? We got nothing yeah. else. We're really, we're still really looking at a struggle to really get equal representation. And the reality is, Hunger Games, the biggest movie of the year, one of the biggest movies around. Um, the female-led movie makes money. We really need to start looking at it less as women don't buy things, women don't do things, women can't lead a show. Let's look at a real story and a real thing. And once we get to that, then I think that we're starting to see some changes. So it's it's little bits. There are glimmers, and then you have that damn Spider Woman cover that just knocks it all back. So a little a little bit. See the the thing with I remember them saying that they've never put Spider Man in that pose before. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Maddox. He did a website for a while called the Greatest Website in the Universe. Huh. Uh, and he was a, like a political commentator, or a social commentator, actually, is a more correct way to put it. And what he pointed out, there's a lot of people saying you'd never draw Spider-Man in that pose, but he actually showed a cover uh, from two or three years ago where Spider-Man was in the exact same pose with his butt way up in the air. It, it, it was pretty crazy because he pointed out the exact cover. It, it's, it's interesting because it, I know the sentiment... But when you say things like they never drew Spider-Man like that, it's like eh, his butt's been in the air before, and it's it's also just as uncomfortable and weird. Well, let's and I've seen the cover, and I disagree with the analysis of the cover. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I want to get too deep in the analysis, but when you look at that cover, and you look at the anatomy of that cover, one is an accurate anatomy, one is an inaccurate anatomy that is meant to sexualize a character. I mean, there was even somebody, I don't know if you saw this, someone took that shot, recreated that shot in a 3D modeling program, and then swung that character up sideways, and it was the most grotesque-looking creature thing you've ever seen in your life. It wasn't possible. I've seen the Spider-Man version of that, and it is not the same physiology. It's really not. So I get it. There have been some poses with Spider-Man where he's crawling, but Spider-Man has not broken his back and his neck, and he doesn't have his costume sucking into his butt cheek so that there's a nice little curve like she's naked. Well, but I'll, but at the same time, Spider-Man had a shitty clone that I still hate to this day because he ruined everything. <laughs> well, ben Riley, right. crap. There's God. that. Damn Whatever. it, Ben Riley. Worse than any sexualized cover ever is freaking Ben Riley. No, no, I, I do get your point, though, but what I think... I think one of the, the best things about the internet, at least in this particular corner of entertainment, uh, is that you know, probably one of the, the biggest example most people point to is Felicia Day in the Guild. Um, but it's just the fact that you know women staked some claims and they went out there and they created material um, early on and they sort of 
it wasn't so much that they broke down the barriers because the barriers thankfully weren't there yet. I mean, especially early in web TV, whoever could get stuff up on the internet had an advantage. Uh, David Nett spoke about this with, um, with gold and stuff like that. It's like, if you could get your stuff up there, uh, and what I really like is it just sort of proved that you didn't need to have those barriers in the first place. Like they can create, they can innovate, they can bring you something entertaining and compelling. And it's like, hey, look, they've always been able to do that. Um, and what I'm worried about is the gatekeeper situation that you talked about. Do you? I I have slight concerns, but do you have concerns that it might sort of pin women back into the same sort of crap? that we, we've been dealing with forever, I mean, really, when it comes to the Hollywood studio system. But yeah. do you have any worries that they might sort of get put back in that corner? Yeah, of course, because the gatekeepers that are forming are the same people who have been running the industry for the past 50, 60, 100 years. It's not like we've got a new crop, a new crop of CEOs that are popping in here. These are the same people who have run things. So until they have a significant change, then, yeah, there's no reason to think that they're suddenly going to change their opinions on female-led programs or female producers or female directors or female actors. Um, if you look at the number of women directors who were um, had movies out this past year, tiny, tiny. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm always a little bit wary of that argument because I still feel like when it comes to certain things, I don't care if you're male or female. I want you to be the best person for the job. I'm not going to give a directing position to a woman just because she's a woman if the man's going to do a better job directing that piece. If I appreciate that man's vision more than that woman's vision, he's going to get the job. Maybe there was nobody that had that vision. I don't know what's going on there, so I'm always wary making that comparison. I do look at that as a correlation to just the overall way that the entertainment industry looks at women in media right now. So unless we have, you know, Disney bought Maker. So Disney, while they're relatively egalitarian and they're very open around things, they're still the same ones that have been making all these movies for years and years and years and years and years. So they're not going to necessarily change their pattern of doing things because of that. So it depends on who the gatekeepers are. And if it's old media that continues to buy up these new media companies, and I'm using weird terms, but if old media buys new media companies and they start taking over, I, I would have to assume that they're going to have similar prejudices. I uh, I call it the car to the cars two effect, is what I personally call it. Um, you know, Disney bought Pixar and everything was fine, and then Disney finally commanded uh, John Lasseter and Pixar to create a sequel to Cars because they wanted it. And uh, we had that abomination with guns and torture and murdering a car on screen and all that. Um, and then that's really that's the risk that I see in the marketplace with. And I completely agree when old media buys new media what's the risk, what's the probability that they're going to sort of grind down what made them innovative and creative in order to fit the system they've done forever. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the audience bites, bites that particular property in the ass by saying, no, like, I'm not accepting this. I'm not, I'm not buying this anymore. Which, unfortunately, they always send the creator, the, the person who's the face of it, to the wolves. You know, Ryan Reynolds was why Green Lantern sucked. It had nothing to do with a crappy script and execution. You know, he's the guy to blame. You know, he's the reason why it went down the toilet. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with you. I think it's a big risk, uh, and I'm very curious to see, especially in the major acquisitions, how it plays out in the end. I'm really curious, and it's actually, honestly, it's one of the reasons that we're revamping the prospectus for the Weird Girls project, because we're going to go to more female-led production houses. Um, and we'll see if that changes things. We'll see. All right, well, I think that's actually a really good place for us to end this evening, Mr. Gardner. Yeah, cool. Um, go ahead. I'm going to put links in the archive section down on the bottom for people seeing on YouTube, but where can people watching live, where can they check out Weird Girls, where can they check out Cell? Oh, wow. Well, you can actually, if you go to weird-girls.com, you can find everything that we're doing with the Weird Girls brand. Uh, we put most stuff up there, but if you want to check everything we do, you need to describe to subscribe to the Weird Girls channel. Just search Weird Girls on YouTube and you'll find it. Or you can search for Lovable Varmint. Lovable Varmint is a production company that everything is shot under. That's on YouTube. You can subscribe to that. You can see all the videos from Danny, Kelly, Zombie. We even have a Dungeons & Dragons game now, which I am loving, and I'm actually on. What? I'm on screen? That's weird. Um, and 
Cell, you can find at sellthewebseries.com, or if you want to, we also have it on the Weird Girls YouTube channel. If you go down, there's a playlist for Cell. I've reposted it there in hopes that some people may find it again and revisit Cell. Watch watch Cell again for the first time. Watch Cell again for the first time. That's good marketing right there. There, That's right good. there. I got you covered, Mark. I got you covered. You want shitty puns? I got shitty puns. You want me to tug at the heartstrings? I'll tug at the heartstrings. Good man. Good man. Because that show is a great sell. Ah! Ooh, pun <laughs> burn! Yeah! I see what you did there. Oh. All right, so I want to thank my guest, Mr. Mark Gardner, uh, for coming out tonight and speaking with us. This was a really great conversation, Mark. I really appreciate you taking the time today, sir. Thank you. Thanks for letting me ramble. I feel like I ramble a lot about all sorts of stuff, and I hope it made sense. I don't know. Oh, no, it, it made sense to me. Um, okay. Part of the reason why I'm doing Talking the Tightrope because I, you know, this is the kind of stuff we don't – there's not a lot of discussion about this stuff, um, like in a, in a sort of public – in a semi – well, this is a public venue, but – there's not a lot of discussion about the nuts and bolts. What's challenging about this? Well, it's hard about this. I mean, we don't. We'll hear about the million cold cast views for sell the series, uh, but we don't get to hear about how you, you know, you bet a lot of your own money on that, um, and and the, and the return that you got from that. And I like to talk about that because, just like you said, people see all the success and they'll see the profit and they'll see the end result, um, but they don't see or discuss what it takes to get there. And that's always, for me, that's always just as interesting as the end product that you got from it. So I really appreciate you taking us from, you know, UT Volleyball through Cell uh, all the way into Weird Girls. And, uh, you know, I'm going to keep following. I'm all about the closet cosplays. Those are fun. Um, you know, I can't dress up as any of them because they're all cool female characters. Uh, oh, and I'm just not, I'm not at that place. I'm just saying I'm not at that place in my cosplay just, yet. Just got to do a gender bent. Just do a gender bent Captain Marvel and you're good. Rule 63. Actually, I could be the old Marvel, um, but then I would do some like cynical joke with like a cancer tumor or something. It just it wouldn't go over well. It just wouldn't be sweet. See, oh, hey, before I forget, I need to throw a plug. Because, plug it up. Um, we have worked with Comic Book Resources and Comic Book Resources and Weird Girls. We've gotten together. We're going to have two panels at Austin Wizard World coming up October 2nd and 3rd. So, if you're going to Austin Wizard World, the Weird Girls are going to be on a panel uh, about the challenges of a YouTube startup on Friday at 2 o'clock. And on Saturday at noon, we're going to have a panel on bringing balance to the fandom, which is women in the fandoms in this space. So if you're going to be in Austin Wizard World, make sure you come down and see us and say hi and, and fill up the things. We can have a lot of people, so we can have other panels there. It's going to be Danny, Kelly, Zombie, Amanda Loon, who is on the uh, Dungeons & Dragons show, myself, um, Lori from Comic Book Resources will be moderating, and Friday Chandler Baker was going to join us as well. So it's going to be the whole crew. We're going to have everybody out there talking about all this stuff. Come on. Live Mark Gardner, live Weird Girls, live Letha from CBR. Come on. How can you pass that up? Mark just gave you the hard sell. You got it. You got to come. Again. I did it again. I just have no shame. <laughs> Coming up, uh, our guests, uh, coming up on October 2nd, we're going to have Ms. Jenny Powell. Uh, she's currently producer of New Adventures of Peter and Wendy. Um, she's also been, from the beginning of Narrate from Scripted Web TV, uh, Lonely Girl 15, The Guild. Uh, she was there with Lizzie Bennett Diary. She's been through Video Game uh, Reunion. She's been through the, the sort of spectrum of these series, and I'm really interested to see her experiences, her view on the evolution of this particular space. Uh, and that will be coming up live on October 2nd. It will actually be our West Coast show. So that will be 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific. So for my guest, Mr. Mark Gardner down in Austin, Texas. Hello. And myself, I am James. I am the man to blame here at Tightrope. If something's made you sad during this broadcast, it's probably because of something I said. Uh, and I got my ass whipped on Kickstarter. It was a pimp slapping. Uh, for Mark Gardner and myself, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you for watching the show on Archive on YouTube if you joined us there. And uh, we will see you soon. Have a good night. Bye.